I'm very pleased to announce to you our uh, keynote lecturer, uh, Benedetto Menicci, from Department of Chemistry, University of Pisa, Italy. The stage is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and sorry for, for, for the delay. <laughs> it's my fault. So uh, I want to start by thanking Carlos and the other organizer for this invitation. It's a real pleasure for me to be here and to talk uh, uh, in this Congress. So uh, my talk will be about uh, part of the, of the research we are doing in my group in Pisa on the modeling of uh, optical properties of uh, multichromophoric biosystems. So why is it so important to, to be able to, to simulate spectroscopy? Well, if you think about uh, a single molecule, uh, from spectroscopy, you can uh, get information about a lot of things. So you can have uh, information about uh, the distribution of electrons, the bonding pattern, the structure, uh, through the vibrational uh, aspects. Uh, you can also, if the system is solvated, you can uh, try to understand intermolecular interactions, uh, reorganization energies from the solvatochronism and the broadening of the spectrum. And then if you use transient spectroscopy, you can have uh, access to excitation dynamics. So this is well known for single molecules. And what, what is more challenging is to study uh, multichromophoric system, sorry, multichromophoric system. Uh, here, for example, I have uh, uh, an example of three uh, chromophores, A, B, C, with A and B interacting, while C is not interacting, and the, the spectrum, the linear absorption spectrum that you get, has two new, new uh, features, which are, can be interpreted as shared excitation between A and B. In this kind of multichromophoric system, it's very useful to go from linear to uh, nonlinear, in particular two-dimensional e electronic spectroscopy. Why? Because uh, in the two-dimensional <coughs> spectroscopy, by using three pulses, you can uh, uh, Fourier transform uh, according, uh, um, the coherence time, the detection time, so to have a two-dimensional spectrum that gives you more information and uh, you, it's very useful to disentangle very crowded spectra. And using like a pump and probe using a waiting time, a different waiting time, you can study the evolution of the system. So how the uh, 2D uh, spectra appear? Here just a very, the same example as here. So I have the two interacting A and B, which uh, from the 2D, it's clear that the excitation are coupled because you have these off-diagonal peaks that connect them while C is uh, alone. And if you wait, uh, uh, if you make the system relax it's in time, you see the appearance of new cross peaks between C and A, B, share excitation, which indicates that there is an energy transfer uh, between these two systems. Moreover, in time, what you see is the change in the broadening of the uh, diagonal uh, systems. So you can follow the time-dependent evolution of this uh, uh, homogeneous and inhomogeneous broadening. So in 2D, there are a lot of information about the multichromophoric nature of the system. So why multichromophoric uh, systems are, are important? So in, the, 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 the excitonic nature of multichromophoric system is used a lot in nature, for example, but also in artificial system to have a very efficient uh, uh, energy transfer system. In particular, in nature, you, you, in photosynthesis, uh, the, the light is uh, collected, uh, harvested by pigment protein complexes called light harvesting antenna, which are present in all types of uh, uh, um, photosynthetic organisms, going from algae, bacteria, and plants. And as you can see from this uh, graphical representation, the, the, the structure and the, and the composition of these, uh, of these uh, light harvesting antennas is very different in the different uh, organisms because it has been optimized for the condition where the organisms live. 
but uh, the, 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 the process is the same for all. So these antenna system absorb light and uh, uh, transfer uh, the excitation energy to the reaction center where it is used uh, to initiate uh, the photosynthetic uh, network of uh, reactions. So today I'll, I'll present you an application of quantum chemical based approaches to study uh, a light harvesting system. In particular, I will focus on a simple Let's call it light harvesting system, which is present in purple bacteria. Here is uh, the, the, the photosystem vesicle, which contains the uh, reaction center in red, surrounded by the so-called light harvesting one uh, system, and around the green stuff is the major light harvesting antenna, called, LH, called LH2. If you look more closely to the structure of this, uh, of this LH2, you see uh, the composition in terms of many pigments. There are chlorophylls, bacteriochlorophylls, and carotenoids. And this is the uh, structure, the circular structure that uh, is typical of this system. So now, as I am a, 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 a theoretical chemist, computational chemistry, what I want to do is to try to reconstruct the, the, the properties of this system by, uh, 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 by starting from the components. So I have the protein and I have the pigments. And what I see is that in terms of pigments, there are 27 bacteriochlorophylls and nine carotenoids. So the question is, can the complex be interpreted and reproduced by the sum of the components? So to, do, to understand this, as I said before, I can look at the spectroscopy and compare the LH2 absorption with respect to the absorption of the single component, the carotenoid and the bacteriochlorophyll. If I look at the, uh, at the region of the carotenoid, I see that more or less the structure of the spectrum is the same as the isolated system, as well as for the so-called the QX uh, uh, excitation of the, and this array is here, and the, um, of the bacterial chlorophyll. So apparently the, 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 the complex is the sum of the single chromophore. But if you look at another region, which is this one, which is the region of the QY excitation of bacterial chlorophyll, so the lowest excitation of bacterial chlorophyll, it's clear that something is happening because the, the excitation, the, 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 the band is shifted and split. So if look, I look more, so now I can forget about carotenoids and say, well, I, I, under, I try to understand the bacterial chlorophyll complex. So if I look at the QI excitation, this is the typical transition dipole, and I look at the LH2 spectra, I can say, well, the two peaks are due to share excitation in the two rings which compose the, 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 the complex. I have the so-called beta 850 ring, which correspond to this peak. I have the other ring, which correspond to this. And the two rings are composed by 18 and 9 chlorophyll. So this means uh, that the QY band is, uh, has been split due to the interaction, the coupling between the excitation in new excitonic band. And this excitonic nature is confirmed by circular dichroism because these molecules, the, the single bacterial chlorophyll, they don't have any CD uh, signals, they are not chiral, but when they are uh, arranged in this three-dimensional structure, two couplets appear which correspond exactly to these two excitation. So circular diagram is, is a real proof of the excitonic nature of this system. But as I said, I can go beyond the linear spectra and I can look at the uh, 2D uh, this is an experimental by uh, the group of Van Grondel in Amsterdam, and they did uh, 2D spectra of this system, and what they observed at waiting time almost zero is the presence of a cross peak, which is, uh, uh, says to us that uh, uh, the two excitons, the two exciton system, the two ring, are also <coughs> coupled. So there is a coupling between the two. This is a weak coupling, but it's still there. And also, uh, from, from, from the broadening, it gives a lot of information about the coupling of this excitation with the bus. So it's a, another source of information. So now I can try to simulate all these uh, properties, but 
Of course, uh, now the situation is more complex, more com difficult than a single molecule because uh, the question that I have to solve are, are, are more intricate than in, when you have a single molecule. So which QM method can I use, which model for the environment, which dynamical description, and which vibronic, which uh, coupling between excitation and, and uh, vibration buff. So as it regards the, the, the environment, the system is too large to be treated quantum mechanically, so what we can do is to switch to an hybrid method so combining quantum chemical description with classical models. And because of the uh, inhomogeneous uh, nature of the, of the protein, we cannot use a continuum model, or at least we can, but it's not accurate enough. So what we do is to use an atomistic strategy. And the standard atomistic strategy is the so-called electrostatic embedding in QMMM. So what does it mean? It means that the QM system uh, feels the, the environment in terms of uh, fixed charges which represent the uh, atoms in the environment. The, the, the good point is that the QM part is polarized, is affected by the environment, but not vice versa, because the point, the point charges are fixed. So the environment doesn't see the QM system. So what we have tried to do is to uh, implement a more uh, refined version of QMMM, which is a polarizable embedding, and in the, in the polarizable embedding uh, uh, that we use in PISA, the formulation is based on induced dipoles. This means that uh, uh, each atom of the, of the environment is characterized by a fixed charge plus a polarizability. This allows the system, the environment, to polarize with respect to what happens in the QM system. More in details, uh, for, for those who are interested, uh, what you do, what you have to do is to solve uh, a system, a linear system that uh, gives you the induced dipole once you know the electric field generated by the QM system and the electric field generated by the fixed charge distribution of the environment. And uh, uh, the problem here, there are two problems when you use a polarizable environment, a polarizable MM. First of all, you have to reparameterize the charges because charges polarizability has to be parameterized together. And you have to be careful about uh, possible overpolarization over -polarization issues. Uh, which uh, uh, prevent a correct description. So to avoid uh, this so-called uh, polarization catastrophe, what you do is to screen the interaction among uh, uh, dipoles when they get close. So you introduce the screening function. Well, when you implement this, now what we can do is to go back to the quantum mechanical system that, uh, as I have shown, is quite large. So we prefer not to use a fully uh, QM description of the entire system, but we use uh, a simplified excitonic Hamiltonian. So if you start from your multichromophoric system, you can build the uh, Hamiltonian of this system by just using the properties of each independent particle, so the excitation localized uh, on each chromophore, and the electronic coupling between excitation. And if you use this, you can reconstruct the Hamiltonian, and by diagonalizing this Hamiltonian, you get the new excitation shared uh, among different pigments, these excitons. So, in, in our case, around the multichromophoric system, you have this environment that can polarize. So, uh, when you excite the single uh, chromophore, in the excitation, what you have to take into account is that you have a transition density connecting the two, and you have a change in the density going from the ground to excited state. If you use a standard QMMM, you don't see anything of this because the, the environment is fixed. But if you use a polarizable one, you can uh, make the environment to respond to both these quantities. And in particular, what I show in this talk is uh, based on TDDFT. So in TDDFT, what you do is to solve this, the famous Casida equation. And what we do is to introduce the effect of the induced dipole in the response matrices, 
So you have a, 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 a responsive environment to the transition and we correct the uh, excitation energy due to the relaxation of the density going from the ground to excited state uh, accompanied by the relaxation of the environment. So these are being presented for both continuum and uh, atomistic polarizable models. So uh, what about the coupling? So as I said, the other ingredient are the couplings between excitation. So uh, if you, uh, as in this case, if you consider bright excitation, so it, in, uh, the interaction between them is dominated by Coulomb interaction. So you can forget about exchange overlap in other weaker interaction. So what we do is to calculate the coupling as uh, uh, this, uh, by doing numerically these uh, integrals, the Coulomb interaction between transition densities localized on two pigments. And if you add the environment, of course, the transition density will be modified by the fact of the environment. But there is also the appearance of a new term, which you can interpret like a screening term in the Foster language, let's say, which represents the interaction of the induced dipole uh, on, on the environment due to the transition on the EDM pigment interacting with the end pigment. And this term is there because the environment is polarizable. So again, it's very important to include a polarizable embedding. So now that I have the model, I can try to simulate uh, uh, the spectrum. Uh, the, 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 here I reported the expression that we, it is known for, for absorption, but here what, which are the differences? So first of all, here is an axitonic transition dipole, so you have to reconstruct it uh, in terms of the properties of the single pigments uh, scaled by the proper excitonic coefficient that you can solve by the excitonic Hamiltonian I've just presented. Then you have uh, the so-called electron phonon induced line shape function that gives you the vibronic uh, uh, property of the, of the excitation, and that in our case is calculated introducing uh, the spectral density. I'll go back in a moment to these properties. And finally, uh, when you have this excitonic system, you have to introduce another source of broadening, which is due to the lifetime of the excitons. So how can we compute all this? Uh, we know how to compute this, but we have to uh, define this. And uh, what is important is that uh, the same, exactly the same ingredients can be used for simulating 2D spectra as shown by Murkiomel. So as a chemist, uh, you know better than me, yesterday we had uh, a beautiful talk by Ines, that uh, there are, in, in chemistry, there are very good methods to study excitation dynamics, and in particular, surface hopping is one of the most powerful techniques to, to, to do that uh, for, for uh, chemical system. In, the, in our case, these methods are still too costly to be used, and so what people generally do is to uh, go through a different formulation, which is very used in the physical community, which is based on the quantum master equation. So what you solve is the, uh, the time-dependent equation for a density. So this is a real equation by using an Hamiltonian, which contains, uh, uh, which has been partitioned in terms of the electronic component, the excitonic Hamiltonian I've just presented, a phonon and electron phonon component. And uh, you can also trace, trace out the um, degrees of freedom of the bath and just get a reduced density and study the evolution of this reduced density. So the solution of this system for large system is very expensive again. So what we generally do is to introduce perturbative solution, perturbative approaches. The two most famous ones are the so-called Foster theory and Redfield theory. So they are different in the, in the, in the component which is used as a, as a perturbation element, which in the Foster theory is the electronic coupling and the system bath coupling for the Redfield theory. So in terms of the physics, the two perturbations correspond to very different physical situation, physical regime. So in the Foster approximation, the Foster limit, you assume that the transfer of the population in the excited state, is, it goes in a hopping way from one pigment to the other, while in the, in the red field theory where the electronic coupling is large, you assume that there are the excitons that relaxes. 
So in this case, you can build, uh, you can uh, simulate uh, your excita excitation dynamics in terms of a rate constant, the famous uh, uh, Foster constant. While in the other case, you have to solve the so-called red pill equation that gives you uh, information about uh, the uh, way the exciton transfer, and in particular, the, the, the red pill theory tells us that the excitonic state M can relaxes on another excitonic state if the energy difference between them matches some of the coupled vibrations. So here the main role is played by the bus, the, vibronic, the vibration bus. And uh, you can calculate uh, the, the, the rate uh, through the function, which is uh, the, one of the main ingredients of this model, which is called the uh, spectral density. And in terms of this rate, you can reconstruct the exciton lifetime. So, if now I want to apply my uh, quantum chemical based method, uh, I can go back to my LH2 system and try to see if it works. <laughs> so, uh, uh, first of all, as I said, the, the, the LH2 is built in terms of 27 equal bacteriochromatic. They are all equal in terms of chemical composition, but the local environment is different one with respect to the other, so you can identify three different types of bacteriochlorophyll, which are generally called alpha, beta, and gamma. And the three of them, the three of them are uh, surrounded by different environments, so you expect that they have different properties. So if you compute the different property with a, a QMMM formulation, uh, if you use a non-responsive environment, so a standard electrostatic environment, you see some difference, but it's very small. This is the tuning of the site energies on each of these three with respect to the isolated bacterial chlorophyll. While when you switch on a polarizable environment, you see a large red shift, which much, much more differentiate as expected the, the three uh, molecules. So now the three bacterial chlorophyll becomes one different, with, becomes three different molecules in some sense. The coupling, what about the couplings? Here I just uh, summarized the calculated coupling for the different interaction. Here I have the P800 in green ring and the B850 ring internal. And these are in, in centimeters minus one. As I expected, the, the two most coupled are the so-called alpha and beta in the B850, but there are not negligible couplings all around the system. In particular, uh, these coupling are uh, obtained by including the effect of the environment. So just to look at the two most, the two largest. If I neglect the effect of the environment, the two couplings are very high, while if I switch on the effect of the environment through our polarizable MM, in one case, the coupling is not changed too much, but in the other case, it is reduced a lot. What happens is that the uh, residues around can act as an enhancer or a quencher of the coupling. And in particular, in this case, the quenching is due, the reduction of the coupling is due to a screening effect of the histidine residues. But uh, uh, by looking at this uh, number, I can say, well, I can try to apply uh, a red field theory that in this case should be better than the, than the Foster. Finally, what I need to do, as I said before, is to compute the, uh, the spectral density. What are the spectral density? The spectral density is the function that quantify how uh, an excitation is coupled to vibration, or vice versa, how a vibration is coupled to an excitation. In our case, however, the problem is that we have uh, an ex excitonic uh, transition, so we can reconstruct, again, this property in terms of site properties, so site spectral density, and an excitonic coefficient. How do the spectral density appear? Are like this, they recall an infrared spectra because you have exactly the uh, peaks uh, centered on the, on the modes which correspond to uh, infrared spectra and the, the, the width of this peak quantify the coupling to the excitation. And in our case, we compute uh, uh, these spectral densities in, in terms of a normal mode analysis of a, a single uh, bacterial chlorophyll in the protein structure. So, 
This is uh, uh, our first uh, uh, comparison between experiment and calculation. This is the experiment uh, measured by Van Grondel at a room temperature. This is in red the impulse that it's important to put in the model. And this is our simulation. It's reasonable correct, but it misses important feature of the, of, the, of the system. So the diagonal bands are too separated, the homogeneous broadening is too small. But what is, we are missing here is the effect of the temperature. So the effect of disorder, which has been also uh, recalled yesterday in the talk, which is very important in proteins. So what we uh, can also, what we know in terms of the effect of the, of the temperature. Of course, the broadening increases as expected, but if you look at circular diagrams, you realize that something more than broadening appears by increasing temperature. There is a shift of the couplet uh, due to the B850. This means that the excitonic state has been modified by the disorder. So in order to introduce disorder, this should be a movie anyway, it's, uh, you, you, what we do is a molecular dynamic simulation, classical molecular dynamic simulation of the LH2 in the membrane by, look, by be, carefully, be very careful on the uh, force field used for the pigments that has to be uh, reparametrized to get the correct picture. And uh, what we do is to, so during these molecular dynamics, we apply our excitonic uh, scheme, QM and Paul, and we uh, uh, reproduce uh, uh, the, the CD spectra along the trajectory. And this is the comparison between the blue uh, spectrum obtained on the single crystal and the uh, red uh, obtained by uh, averaging over the dynamics. As, a, you can, as you can see, we have the broadening, which is expected, but we have also the shift. And this shift is due to a fact that during, due to the disorder, the coupling between the, the system uh, changes a lot together with the site energies. And this effect of disorder is very important because now you have excitons. The excitons are uh, shared excitation. So if you move the energy and the coupling between this excitation, you change completely the nature. And to look at, the, to, to quantify this change due to the disorder, we can measure the length of the, of the, of the exciton, which is the length. The, the, how much is the localized in terms of pigments? So if you have a very, uh, symmetric system, you have that delocalization is maximum, so the length is maximum, 18 for the B850 or 12, depending on the, uh, on the state, and nine for the B800. But when you, you introduce disorder, this uh, uh, length reduces a lot. This is uh, the average value, so it reduces from 18 to 8, to, from 9 to 2. So this means that these excitons localizes on smaller clusters. And this has uh, an effect on the uh, transfer time uh, because, uh, as you can see here, uh, well, within the, the B850, the, the coupling is so large that the transfer time is ultra fast and not so sensitive to temperature. But what is sensitive to temperature is the transfer time from the, two, from the highest energy ring to the lowest energy ring. That uh, we compute the, to be around one picosecond in, um, in uh, crystal structure and added disorder. This is reduced a lot and it is uh, in reasonable agreement with the experiment. So now that I have this picture, I can go back to my 2D spectrum and I can introduce all these uh, in, or the ingredients calculated in terms of uh, a disordered, time-dependent disordered system. And as you can see now, the agreement between uh, calculation and experiment is much better. So this clearly shows that these excitonic systems are very sensitive to temperature, what is expected because the system has to be optimized to work at uh, room temperature. And uh, uh, indeed, uh, quantum chemical based approaches can at least uh, semi quantitatively uh, reproduce uh, this, this picture. So, to conclude, I guess I'm at the end, uh, what uh, we have, uh, at least we have understood, is that uh, this multichromophoric biosystem, uh, the main actor is indeed the protein. So, the protein. Uh, not only uh, defines 
through the scaffold, the arrangement of the pigments and through the residues, their local environment. But it, uh, the protein field uh, in a fluctuating way uh, tunes the excitonic states by changing site energies and coupling. And finally, the protein fluctuations can control the time scale of the light driven uh, function. So just to conclude, I hope that I have convinced you that quantum chemistry combined with the uh, uh, molecular dynamics approach, uh, polarizable embedding, indeed can be used to uh, understand the nature of the photo-induced function in multi-homophoric biosystem. Uh, of course, you have, it's more complicated than a single molecule because you have to include all these in ingredients, the environment effect, the excitonic parameters, the exciton phonon coupling, the disorder in a, in a coherent way. Of course, much more still needs to be explored. For example, now we are working on the role of charge transfer states that are not at the moment involved, are not included in this model. Non-electrostatic effect, we expect, for example, that dispersion effect can have a role. And also, we, we, have to, we want to go beyond uh, this uh, non -per uh, perturbative redfield-like, uh, uh, for example, going back to uh, surface hopping techniques. And uh, this is the group, uh, my group in Pisa, that now is changing because a lot of people have moved. And also, I want to thank uh, external collaboration, uh, Jean-Philippe Picamar for the um, and Paul, together with Carlos Colucetti at the University of Barcelona, we, that started with me, the development of QM and Paul, and Claudia Filippi, University of Twente, Marco Garavelli for the 2D spectroscopy, and Richard Kochdel as a bi biologist for helping us to understand the system. And thank you for your attention. Have an advertisement. After next year, after ICQC, there will be a satellite in Pisa about photo induced processes in embedded system. So, if, if you are interested, please come. Okay. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk and uh, very nice uh, uh, example of uh, application quantum chemistry and uh, computational chemistry to life systems. And session is open for questions. Any questions? You mentioned at the end, oh, sorry, that um, dispersion could eventually play a role. And of course, that's a topic that I'm also very much interested in. Uh, how would you uh, describe dispersion um, in the excited state yeah. process? Yeah, uh, this, is, uh, this is indeed uh, not easy. Uh, we are now working uh, on a model to in a, still in an hybrid formulation. So what I'm interested in is more dispersion between the chromophore and the environment. Okay? Okay, yeah. And, so and only I'm one is excited. And yeah, exactly. And uh, we, are, we are trying to develop uh, uh, within a, a responsive MM formulation following the um, theory developed by Tachenko and Scheffler. We are trying to follow this way, okay. but we are still at the beginning. Okay. okay, we can have a couple more questions. Yes. Really nice work, thank okay. you. Um, just towards the end, you showed it was important to include disorder yeah. to get the shape of the, the peak closer to experiment. And you mentioned at the beginning that the rotation of the peak um, reflects some of the, the physics of the, of the system. Can you say a little bit more about how that arises and whether your sampling is complete and exactly reproduces the orientation or is there still a little bit more to do? Yeah, indeed, uh, this is a, a very important issue in the sense that uh, when you have this excitonic system, uh, it's very difficult to be sure that you have... Uh, really uh, uh, simulated uh, your dynamics and fluctuation in a complete way, I agree with you. Um, what, we, uh, what we have tried to, want to, to do is to, is to check the convergence of our results, of course, 
And uh, here, what we have seen is that uh, this LH2 system is very tricky because uh, uh, the, uh, the, the ring where the, 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 the chromophores are very coupled, the, the role, the main role is the, exactly the coupling. So the, effect, uh, the main effect in the shift is due to the change on the coupling. And this is not due to internal, intramolecular motion, but to intermolecular effect like this, which are even <laughs> more difficult, I agree. You cannot be sure that you are completely <laughs> right. But, uh, we are trying to understand step by step, but it's, it's a very important issue. We, we are now using also QM, MM dynamics. <clears throat> One more question. Okay. Uh, You have the, um, well, these peaks have a, a width along the diagonal and across the diagonal. And in your last calculation, the length along the diagonal, which I guess represents the different environments sampled in the dynamics, was looking quite good. But the peak at 800 looked much too broad off the diagonal. It was, yeah. get, what, do you immediately get physical insight into why this is happening? So we are now uh, exactly trying to understand uh, the broadening and uh, we think that what we are missing are charge transfer. So now that uh, we have the, an, an extension of excitonic approach to include charge transfer states, we have seen that uh, fluctuation in the coupling between the charge transfer states and excitonic states is a, a, an important uh, source of broadening. So is that not still first broadening the peak away from the diagonal? Yeah, there is also an effect of uh, shifting the peak uh, along the diagonal, but there is uh, also an effect on the homogeneous broadening. And it's quite significant, this. We are just now trying to include it. But it's, uh, it's not known experimentally. They don't understand the origin of this broadening, which is very different for the two peaks. Okay, uh, I think there is no more question. Okay, again, let's thank to Benedetta for thank this you. wonderful talk. Thank you.